Lauren, it's great to see you again for another Daily Cop Drop. How are you doing? Very well, thanks. How are you, Gopal? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, this is a lot of fun going live every day with you. And for those who are watching, welcome to the Cop Drop, a daily live stream during COP28 that's hosted by the Faith to Biodiversity Coalition and the United Religions Initiative. Each day we'll be discussing the latest developments from Dubai with a focus on nature and biodiversity. And we'll also learn about some of the amazing ways of faith and spiritual communities all around the world are working to protect and restore the environment. My name is Gopal Patel. I serve as the co-convener for the Faith to Biodiversity Coalition. I'm based in New York City. And I'm joined by my friend and colleague, co-host Lauren Van Ham, the United, the United, sorry, she is the Climate Action Coordinator at the United Religions Initiative. And Lauren, where are you based exactly? Aren't you, you're in California somewhere, Northern California? That's right. Yeah, I'm in Richmond, California, uh, Ohlone Territory, San Francisco Bay Area. Nice, nice. Well, thank you for joining us again, everyone. And today we will be joined by Gavin Edwards, who's the director of the Global Nature Positive Initiative at WWF. He'll be zooming in live from Dubai. He's just running a bit late. It's a busy time there at the end of their second day. A lot of big announcements have been made, so he'll be joining us momentarily. Um, but Lauren, I wanted to get started with you, if I can, because um, this morning we saw a lot of, um, well, Dubai's morning um, hour right. while we were sleeping time uh we, we saw we saw some really um we saw world leaders getting up and and addressing everyone um and there were two because i'm from england originally there are two speakers that i pay a little bit more attention to which are king charles and the british prime minister rishi sunak and they both said something um which i thought were really important king charles said the earth does not belong to us and i feel that was like a really strong I don't know where he got it from, but I'm assuming he got it from his faith because he is a person rooted in his faith and spirituality. So I think that was a really strong signal for him from him that the earth does not belong to us. And Rishi Sunak, the British government, has been criticized in different parts of the press for backsliding on various climate net zero commitments. But one thing he said today, which I'm really appreciative of, is that he said that a climate solution does not exist without nature. And for me, that is a, it's not a game changer because I think a lot of people are saying that, but for someone of his caliber and his office to say that really means that nature is now being seen as part of the solution for climate, whereas before it was very much seen as like a separate issue. So those are the two things that I was very happy to hear this morning. Uh, just wondering what your reflections are on, on those two statements. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a really significant shift when we are focusing maybe a little bit less on I don't know, the technicalities of carbon emissions or the count and that sort of thing. And we start really placing ourselves within a living system. Um, Earth does not belong to us is certainly a, a, a version of that. And I'm aware that today there was also a food systems declaration that I think is um, speaking about, I mean, they're talking about actual food and agriculture in national climate plans and, and scaling up funding for this sort of thing. But when we um, dig a little bit more deeply into what that looked like today, um, we also start seeing the advocacy for uh, small scale farming and what we know that means in a in a nature positive or nature based solutions approach is that it's it's permaculture, it's more organic, it's um, more inclusive of biodiversity. So I think that's really exciting. What what do you think? Yeah, I think um, it's been interesting again for those of us who have tracked the climate conferences and conversations for many years now. It feels like it has veered you know, into like a very, very technical conversations and things that you thought would be obvious parts of the conversation have been left out or haven't been fully included, you know, so nature, obviously, which I mentioned, but now food being part of the conversation is so important and, and a recognition that, you know, a climate solution is not viable without reforming of our food systems um, is, is so obvious to, to those of us who work with communities all over the world. And so it's great to see that recognition, you know, on 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 day on day two of, of the COP. And I think what's going to be interesting now is to see 
kind of how the connection between nature and food is made going forward now that we have this recognition of food increasing awareness of nature and i'm wondering if you could share a little bit because you know united religions initiative works with faith groups all over the world you have a thousand cooperation circles what do you have any examples or stories of what faith communities are doing at a very grassroots level um around food systems yeah yeah it's true it's um it's really exciting to me. There's something like 440 million small scale farms. Wow. And for in, in, in the URI network or in the world in general? Worldwide. Worldwide. Okay. All right. Let's make so it when, when we then think about the number of cooperation circles who are, um, you know, living in very rural areas or kind of remote villages and they are, um, you know, in many ways, it's like they have always been doing this. Right. Um, and and so uh, we need to be thinking about what has kind of always been alive and mm-hmm. protecting that. Let's protect these um, or organic farms, these regenerative practices, and also encourage them to proliferate in, instead of becoming monocrops or you know, big agriculture as we understand it. So I think that there's um, an, an exciting endorsement here. I will say that um, in the last couple of years, what we are seeing quite a bit of is agroforestry. So, right. so what is that exactly? Yeah. So we have some cooperation circles who are very intentionally um, planting trees and right. specific kinds of trees within what was previously only a crop. And we know that ecologically there is benefit in doing it this way. And more and more of our cooperation circles are appreciating this. They are teaching each other how to do it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, more trees are going in the ground, but that also um, is is really good for for farming practices. So is it like crops used to grow there and now the crops don't grow? So they're growing trees in the same area the same spaces or they're growing trees and crops kind of intermingling with each other they intermingle them that's right and and there's a mutual there's a symbiotic benefit to doing it that way um trees create um more shade more water and uh, yeah and the crops are more diverse that way yeah it it makes it makes total sense. It makes total sense. And you'll see, and w- what sh- what trends have you seen? Oh, we're joined by Gavin. He's made it. Hey, Gavin. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, both. I'm uh, speaking a little bit of traffic here in COP28, uh, but um, couldn't uh, couldn't find a reason not to be here. So here I am in the interview, and uh, very good to connect with you. That's both. fine, Gavin. This is the nature of the drop cop. We are live every day during cop 28 um alex yesterday was on the streets of dubai you're stuck in a car um uh how how's how's your day been going so far uh pretty busy uh yeah lots going on here quite hectic on the first day a lot of world leaders in town as well so everything gets a little bit backed up uh the conference venue but these are minor details compared to uh the discussion uh, For sure. uh yeah yeah, we, we were just talking about um, some of the leader statements that came out today. I saw Rishi Sunak said that there's no climate solution without nature. Uh, King Charles was talking about how the earth does not belong to us, which is like a very strong faith sentiment. Um, and then we were just talking about the food and climate declaration that also came out today. So wondering if you could just share, you know, what have you been tracking? What are, what have you been, what are, what are you kind of impressed by or, or happy about from a nature perspective over the last, like, last couple of days? Yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously that the the declarat the, the commitment by more than 130 countries uh, on food and agriculture is is uh, it's good on the surface, but we also feel that the time for high level commitments is kind of passed. Uh, COP26, we saw a lot. We've seen a lot come out of New York Climate Week as well. Uh, we really need to pivot to action. Uh, this is supposed to be the decade of action, the decade of uh, ecosystem restoration. Uh, the decade when we have the agreements in hand. Uh, and so I think uh, a little more, more action uh, is needed uh, as well. Having said that, it is good to hear leaders reference nature uh, and put nature high on the agenda. I should say, of course, the phase out of fossil fuels uh, is 
uh, uh, probably the, the single most important outcome that could come out of COP28. Uh, if that could be an outcome, the science is very clear on it. Uh, 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 more and more governments are seeing uh, this need as well. Uh, if, if emissions are to decline steeply, that needs to happen. But that's not enough. Action on nature is necessary as well. And so it was really heartening to hear uh, King Charles today uh, talk about net zero and nature positive uh, in his speech. Uh, and to other leaders, as you mentioned, uh, referencing nature as well. So nature is up and in the conversation, uh, which is good. Uh, it has been rising the last couple of years, which is good. It's certainly peaked in Montreal with the Global Biodiversity Framework. Uh, but action, action, action uh, is really going to be how we judge uh, the success uh, of these two weeks in Dubai. Yeah, thanks, Gavin. And I want to get to the action bit you know, because that's what the Face of Biodiversity Coalition, that's why we exist. But what else is WWF tracking there and advocating for during COP28? Um, I mean, essentially, uh, the you know, as well as uh, uh, the f- a fossil fuel phase out, uh, we'd like to see uh, more, uh, just a, a much stronger focus on nature, food systems, agriculture uh, uh, as an outcome of this uh, and a rise in nature based solutions. The, the global stock take and the outcome of the global stock take uh, will will point to the deficiencies in general, uh, but also the, uh, on nature as well. So we're tracking very closely the global stock take, the formal outcome uh, of COP28, uh, and we fully expect in uh, lobbying to ensure uh, that nature uh, is a part of that outcome as well, because that sets governments up. It essentially says this is the gap between what you promised in Paris uh, and in a one and a half degree world. Uh, and these are the kinds of actions you should be taking. For example, in uh, government's national uh, action plans, there's not much guidance around how they formulate what they should be doing on nature, what they should be doing on food systems, what they should be doing on energy. That has to be tightened so that governments can be much more clear uh, uh, in future and held to account much more easily. Uh, than they are today, uh, whether that's restoration of mangroves, uh, whether that's extending spatial conservation, or, or, or many of the other actions that governments can and should be taking as well. Right. So how do we move then from action? You know, you mentioned the GBF, you know, the signaling from the high level leaders over the last couple of days. You know, we, Lauren and I were just talking about the significant work faith groups are doing on the ground when it comes to agroforestry and other kinds of, you know, nature positive activities. How do we start moving in, as you said, in this decade of action? Sure. Well, I mean, there is a really good opportunity coming up. Uh, and the, the global stock take will show that governments have not done enough uh, so far. There's a second opportunity next year at COP16 where every government has to put together its national strategy, national biodiversity strategy and action plan uh, to, uh, to describe exactly what it will do to realign its national approaches to conservation. It has to do this with the engagement uh, of a whole of society approach. That means the business community needs to be engaged. The finance sector needs to be engaged. Civil society uh, needs to be engaged as well. Uh, in both formulating and implementing those plans down to the community level. Uh, and so that's that's really the opportunity uh, in the next 12 months. Uh, and that's where the potential for real action needs to happen. And there is a multilateral uh, timeline, an agreed timeline, uh, for those plans to come into place and to be articulated and then, of course, implemented uh, after that as well. So I think that's really the next big opportunity in the calendar. Yeah, that, that, that's... Sorry, go on, Lauren, please. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, Gavin, um, so I'm representing the United Religions Initiative, and I, I think you're aware that we have grassroots cooperation circles around the world. And as you were talking about getting these um, plans kind of down to the community level, um, what what might you say, what would be your inspiration or, um, you know, I don't know, top two or three things that you would want the grassroots to hear from you around what we can be doing sure yeah so the first thing to do is look to your government are they inviting you in to a conversation about working at different scales for conservation uh i've just hearing from our colleagues in nepal uh where the government there has been engaging uh with different communities and indigenous organizations around exactly what those action plans should like every government has an obligation and a responsibility to do this. Uh, as WWF, we've produced a toolkit which will help navigate this uh, for you as well. Maybe we can make the 
uh, in the chat or something. Maybe we can make it available, that toolkit. And that yep. will give ideas. You don't have to be a technical policy expert uh, to engage in this. You come with your ideas, uh, whether it can be a local restoration uh, project, a local conservation project, a local community-led project, uh, uh, and bring that into the conversation and ensure it is recognized at the regional and national level as well. And that will certainly help. And so that will probably be my most important uh, piece of advice uh, over the next 12 months. Yeah, that's great. I'm uh, I'm aware that WWF uh, last year um, at COP, along with the United Nations Environment Program and Trillion Trees created the tree growing guide for faith groups. And and I'll be sure that I talk about that at some point during COP28. Oh, yeah. But it's good to hear about this toolkit as well, so that, um, you know, the governments and the grassroots groups are in conversation. Um, and the grassroots groups as the actors are are making some things happen and not and not getting caught in some of the, the red tape or the waiting. Exactly. Yeah, it's really it's really important. There. I mean, twofold, actually be implementers on the ground, show best practice, show what best practice looks like, communicate that uh, so others can learn from it uh, as well. And encourage governments at the same time and say, hey, this is how it looks. This is how it should be done. Uh, uh, and over to you, over the governments, which of course have much more capacity, but don't sit and wait, uh, don't sit back and wait. Uh, take the leadership uh, uh, at every level. In my 30 years of conservation, I've seen incredible movements start from the ground up. Uh, we should definitely be encouraging more and more of that. Gavin, are you in a self-driving car or is someone driving you? Yeah, somebody is uh, is driving us to the dinner we were supposed to be at, and uh, because and yeah, everything's a little bit backed up, uh, but we're here now, so uh, I can show you a little bit of the skyline uh, if your viewers. Uh, would sure, like yeah, why did why don't you show us that? And then we'll Doing a nice it. tour of Dubai. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, and we can, uh, I think, we can step out of the car now. Uh, one second, can we step out of the car now? I'm going to be serving you uh, to the dinner. Oh, we're going to the dinner. Okay. <laughs> okay, Gavin, this I is think... real life here. <laughs> That's real life. Okay, well, we'll let you get to your dinner. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Um, and we'll check in with you during the rest of the conference, but in enjoy the rest of your night. Yeah, He's happy to do it. another one as well. Yeah, but thank you very much. And thanks for the invitation today. Thanks, Gavin. Take care. Take Goodbye now. Thanks, Gavin. Bye. Thanks, bye. Bye bye. So there you are, Lauren. That's real life. That's Gavin from the streets of Dubai. Um, any thoughts, reflections on what he said? Yeah, I think, you know, there's there's a lot there for us, uh, at least in, in the URI network, or thinking about faith groups as um, the ones who try to walk our talk and um, hearing about how to um, protect the the nature that is is already here for us um you know in in terms of what's on our plot of the house of worship or the garden that we tend um but then also um continuing to to model and grow this intention um yeah, yeah that was that was good yeah i think that's a strong point because so much of what it almost feels like sometimes these multilateral processes are trying to catch up with what's been happening at the grassroots for many, many years. And it feels like this is one of those moments where the COP, the UNFCCC, the process is now acknowledging that food systems need to be reformed if we are to address climate or that nature and climate are connected. And as you said earlier, our communities have believed that and have worked with that frame for generations, you know? Um, and so like you're saying, it's so important for grassroots faith communities, if they're doing the good work to connect with their national and international bodies to show this is this is leadership these this is things these are things that work yeah yeah and it, and it may even be a place where there's some um resistance required right to resist mm -hmm. um the um encringement if you will of of big agriculture on spaces that have been previously protected um, and and we become the advocates for biodiversity, if you will, and and say, don't bring that here. We're protecting right. this. Yeah, I think 
yeah, we have to, in many ways, it's a word I don't like to use so much, but it's like, it's a way for us to show our power. Yeah. Um, like if we're not telling others and the world what we're doing, it's easier for big corporations or other big in, institutions exactly. to kind of take over. So there is a need. I know in faiths, there is this desire to stay humble and meek, you know, and not broadcast to the world. But at the same time, we do have to show up when we're doing good work because that's in, not just in our own self-interest, but in the self-interest of the planet as well. Yeah. And, you know, we can do that in in gentle and constructive ways, too, through eco-literacy and modeling. And I'm sure we'll talk more about that in the coming days. Yeah, for sure. OK, so I think, shall we wrap it up for today? This is good for now. Yep. OK. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. And uh, <laughs> we'll see everyone again tomorrow for the Drop Cop. Looking forward to it.